Um, I don't know if that is a question I understand, but if you are saying uh, who am I am, yes, of course, uh, many people would say I'm Moses Cheboy, and that is me. I was born in a small village, not small anymore, called Olengurwani, in Kuresoi South, uh, just over 50 years ago. I schooled around there. Of course, I started some brief uh, schooling in Akuru, in a primary called Mamangina, but went back to Olengurwani all the way to my class seven. I studied in the old system, the one which ended in class seven. So from there, I went to Cabernet High School uh, for my O levels, 83 to 86. And then eventually to Moi High School, Kabarak, in Akuru County, and uh, came to Nairobi University thereafter, and later the School of Law. We, we normally do some diploma after the university. Now, that is briefly my schooling life. I did not say much more about that. Uh, I am one of those leaders, uh, I, cannot, I can say easily that I'm not a leader by birth, because I've always said, and I remember saying before, and people didn't believe it, uh, I was not assigned any leadership role early in my life. And whenever I tried, I always lost. I tried to be a leader in scouting movement. I didn't succeed. I lost to my neighbor many times. Uh, who had a lighter skin than myself. Uh, I also, didn't, I was never given any opportunity to lead anything in my schooling life, at least the, the, the elementary school life, all the way to Form 6. I never became a class monitor. Uh, once in a while, I would uh, vie for some positions that were not very competitive and succeeded. I became uh, uh, a leader of wildlife club and debating club because I talk more, I talk a lot. But when I went to university, that is when my leadership uh, probably started because I ended up becoming a secretary general of Nakuru University students. Uh, those days uh, we had been reduced. That is, during my time is when SONU was not active. It became active just after uh, I left university. So I was leading uh, the one for Nakuru University students as secretary general. That is my life as far as uh, I think I have answered you a bit. Uh, well, yeah, true, I practiced as a lawyer briefly. Uh, initially, after my first employment was a legal officer, municipal council of Nakuru, which I did for just a year. I think I'm an impatient person. Then I became, uh, a pra I practiced, I opened my own firm, Cheboyan Company Advocates, which, uh, well, did some practice, not, uh, not too much of it but I was a practicing lawyer for some time, basically doing a few other things and mostly uh, conveyancing. Uh, well, but I think something is running in a family, so I was always interested in politics, even if I didn't look to be doing very well in my earlier life in terms of that. But I was interested in politics. My family is, uh, is, is, is political. My father vied many times. Uh, for a parliamentary seat, he didn't succeed himself. Very closely, almost won in 1988. My own maternal uncle mm, was a member of parliament for Buret for a long time. He even eventually became a speaker of the National Assembly, uh, the late Professor Jonathan Ngeno. So generally, I think I, politics is my passion, uh, that I can say. I don't think I would do very well in many other things, maybe other than farming. Yeah, yes. That is it. That's how I got myself into this politics. I joined politics in 2002 and won election that year. And uh, I was representing Kuresoi, not Kuresoi North. So I served Kuresoi for one term. That's between 2002 and 2007. And then uh, had a break, came back in 2013, now representing Kuresoi North, because at that point it had been divided into two. So I represented, uh, I've represented Kuresoi North from 2013 to date. I hope still to, you know, continue uh, leading that particular constituency. Um, quite a lot of things I can say I've achieved. First of all, let's start with the uh, uh, resettlement of people who are landless. In the year 2005, um, we managed to get the, I'm sure you know of the small community called Ogyek, they had been having a big issue with the settlement in three particular settlement areas, which is Tinet, Endoinet, and Sinol Settlement Scheme. 
we managed to broker with government and enabled them to get land and have titles to that particular land. That was my happiness because it was my campaign played for 2002, which I succeeded before the end of that particular term. Uh, there are many other things that I've achieved. I think as a constituency, uh, particularly Kuresoi North constituency, I think we have had the greatest expansion in the education sector uh, in the last 10 years. When I joined parliament, for example, a certain uh, ward, let me put it, I had about five uh, secondary schools when I joined, uh, joined parliament in this particular part of Kuresoi North. Because when it was divided, the part of Kuresoi North had barely five. We are proud of 40 now, 40. The primary schools, uh, other than the expansion of in terms of numbers, we have also, uh, you know, had a very good face to our schools, getting uh, permanent structures, beautiful ones. That, in my opinion, is, is one of my greatest achievements because uh, I realize in a constituency like ours, it would be very difficult for people, uh, stu people uh, students and young people to go to school if the schools are far. We made it cheaper and easy for them because you can imagine in a place where people are not extremely rich, if you want to take them to other constituencies and boarding schools, they cannot afford. So that was my, I think is one of my achievements. And maybe uh, spiritually also I've done quite well in terms of construction of churches. I did not manage to get my target. I wanted in this term alone, for example, to do 100 churches. I was not able to because of many things, including the COVID pandemic. And they, at one point, you remember, there were no congregations in church. At that point, you know, the people did not have money. But I've done very well there. It's something that I'm very proud of because I am a Christian myself. And I realize some of these things are easily resolved when we have uh, the religious sector quite well. So those, there are many other things. We started uh, hospitals when when we did not have uh, uh, the county governments. Remember, initially, a member of parliament was able to do many, many of these things. Now, we have been restricted to mostly schools and uh, administrative infrastructures. But then we could, uh, I can say, we established uh, health centers in areas that I'm sure uh, nobody would have remembered. I am very proud of one called Kimes one. I'm very proud of the Sirikwa one. I have quite a number which we bought land and established dispensaries where, you know, I remember I sometimes feel very proud when I see a mama uh, going to the dispensary and uh, giving birth to a child and naming that a child after me makes me very happy. Seguton, for example, Health Centre did not have land. We bought land and constructed. We have one called Chip Kinoyo. They did not have land. We even did a Harambe and constructed a health centre. They are now thriving and helping our people. Well, uh, I wouldn't want to talk about mismanagement of CDF fund because looking at uh, the Auditor General's report for Kuresoi North constituency, because I really basically deal with my own constituency, we have had a clean bill of health uh, continuously for several years now. Uh, once in a while, we see some red flag on issues, for example, to do with the... Uh, uh, sometimes we utilize an emergency arises and uh, probably um, the Auditor General doesn't think that we should have placed that money as an emergency. It should be something that we should have planned. But by and large, we have had a clean bill of health in terms of uh, our CDF uh, management. And it is something that I should say, we should really thank um, the originator of CDF. Because really, and that was a member of parliament uh, who served with us between 2002 and 2007, he did very well. Because that thought alone has changed lives of our people. Uh, well, but remember, after promulgation of the new constitution, the, uh, you know, the position of a member of parliament was reduced to an oversight role, basically. But... Uh, we still are able to manage our constituency CDF using public participation. Remember, these are people we represent. We are able to tell them, look, a better priority will be this, not the other one. It is something that has worked. I think it has worked better than any other fund. It has worked better than the county government funds, and I'll tell you why. In my own constituency, once in a while, I'm accused, for example, of, uh, of, 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 of allocating quite some little money to some projects. 
is because we realize that we have too much to do and too little money. Uh, what we do as a constituency is we do a labor-based contract. We never give out a full contract. If you compare our cost, a classroom by the county or by the national government itself would cost about between 1 million and 1.2, most of the time 1.2. When you go to a labor-based contract, first you enable the common man to benefit. Because if you give a contractor coming from a different constituency or coming from a different county, for example, he might come with his uh, workers. What we have done is to make sure that our own people benefit, including women, just taking water to the project and uh, enabling the, the project to, 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 to go on. Uh, so I use between 600 and 650. And I'm not saying I use as myself. I'm saying our CDF of Kuresoi uses 600,000, between 600,000 and 650 for the same classroom that would have costed 1.2 million. That in itself has enabled us to construct so many classrooms. We have uh, refurbished so many classrooms. We have done very well, basically, that's what I can say. I have no strategy. I would ask, my, I would ask somebody else to tell me what they think is my strategy. I think, um, basically, it is uh, having a good relations with uh, the constituents availing myself to, to meet them. I hardly go to my office and also I hardly have people coming to my home because what I do more is to go to their places. I go around, I go to schools. It is something I don't feel comfortable in Nairobi. If you ask me where I am most at peace, is in my constituency or, or at the golf course. I mean, those are the two places I'm very, very happy uh, being in. So, and I feel, I, it, initially when I joined politics, I had that phobia of, um, of, of the population, of, of human beings. You know, because initially you used to think that uh, people come to you with problems only, and sometimes you have no capacity to sort out some of the problems they are coming to you with. But over time, I think I matured and realized that um, whatever you are able to do, tell them you are able and you do it. So when you tell uh, your constituents there is something that you find difficult to do, they will understand because they would know that whatever you are able to do, you will. Many times they ask us to participate in Harambe's and most of the time we are able to come through. But sometimes you are not able. You tell them this time I am no. And they understand. They don't quarrel, they don't complain. So over time we gelled with the community. Initially my constituency, if you will remember, it was also a hotspot in terms of clashes and uh, tribal uh, tensions. But I managed to bring them together. I realize the only thing that brings people together is making sure that each one of them gets a share of uh, the resources that belongs to them. You know, everybody is a taxpayer in, in spite of your tribe, religion or whatever. So what I have done, and that should actually go on record as my greatest achievement ever, bringing Kuresoi together, Kuresoi North, bring it together. Right now, uh, you know, a Kalenjin would get a vote from Akikuyu. Akikuyu would get Kalenjin vote. Last election I was competing with a friend of mine called uh, Dam Kanirungu. And he got quite some numbers of uh, Kalenjin votes. He's a Kikuyu himself. I personally got over 8,000 Kikuyu votes in the last general election. Something that never used to happen in Kuresoi. It is just that, um, you know, you have to talk to people and they understand. And give them their resources. Let them get their share. And that is my proudest thing. That from a constituency that was full of crises, tribal and political tensions, Right now, I think we have managed it very well. As I've told you, I told you initially, I just liked politics. That's why I was in debating club. That is why I was in Nakuru University students. I like politics. Uh, there was not so much expectation out of it. Of course, other than a serious salary. I thought it was going to be very big. And Kenyans believe it is big, actually. I remember one time a former member now, a friend of mine, uh, who was a member for Nakuru Town constituency. When it was still the Nakuru Municipal, it was one constituency. I could see him struggling sometimes even to buy us lunch when he comes from Nairobi. That is uh, the Honorable David Manyara, former member for Nakuru. And we used to patronize the same club. So I would wonder why a member who earns some 300,000 cannot, when he comes from Nairobi, be able to buy lunch for quite a number of people at the same time. But when I came to Parliament, I realized that, um, you know, once you come here, even with the salary, however big it is, the commitments are equal. 
to that um, that salary. Of course, I know that is a sensitive area. Nobody would want me to speak about it, but I'm just giving an experience. That then, uh, you know, if it is an expectation of making a kill out of parliament, probably anybody who wants and has that uh, notion in mind, not too much. I have seen many members of parliament who've come here very rich and gone out of it, uh, you know, quite depleted because there are a lot of commitments. It is better now because we have the governors, we have the senators, we have the women rep, so we are able to share uh, those difficulties. But still, everybody seems to still think the only person who has the capacity to solve their problems is a member of parliament in terms of member of the National Assembly. The senators, many of the times, uh, escape with everything because really, if you ask them, they would say, no, I could not come to you, Arambe, because in, I was in a different constituency. But for us, uh, we are not that lucky. So I can say, uh, I didn't have a lot of expectation. I wanted to come here and make some little difference, small differences, uh, and not only legislative difference, because sometimes people come here thinking that uh, the basic core, you know, core function that you, ha you are supposed to fulfill is uh, legislation. Is, that's not the basic one. But you know, if you are able to go out with something good, like for example, what uh, the Honorable Joe Kindungu did, that is good for you. But there are many, many other small things that also matter. When I see sometimes also members of parliament accused of not speaking in parliament, I think um, members of public misunderstand the National Assembly completely. Because it's not so much about speaking here. There are committees that you need to do things that can be done well. Come and manage the issues of budget, very critical but also manage some other things uh, that are representative in nature. Deal with your constituents, make sure that you are, you know, uh, sol solving some of their small, small issues that you are able to make that they themselves could not have been able to. Ah, that's, an comp that's a very debatable issue. Uh, in my first term, I, first term, that's 2002-2007, I served as an ordinary backbencher only participating seriously in the uh, Committee on Justice and Legal Affairs, the one led by the Honorable Mwita then, and briefly with the Public Investment Committee. Then, uh, of course, there was nothing much that, uh, you know, in terms of visibility, you could not be seen. Uh, and therefore, I could say the fact that I was not in very active position probably had an issue. Uh, but come 2013, 2017, I became the first chair of committees. That is the lead uh, member of the, uh, the speaker's panel. And I can tell you, it really propelled me. My constituents would never miss me at all at home and ask me where you are. Because even that who doesn't see me over the weekend would easily see me on TV. And I was very active because uh, the deputy speaker then, Dr. Laboso, had been elevated to a chair in one of the committees of ACPEU. ACPEU is uh, African Caribbean Parliamentarians uh, Stock European Union par members of parliament. So she was not always in the country because of the, the, the kind of work she had. So I took charge of what she should have been doing. So I was quite visible. Come 2017, 2022 20, uh, now, uh, I became the deputy speaker and opposed. Uh, and same publicity, same, uh, I had a lot of, uh, but there was a small problem. My constituents and other people think that uh, when you have that kind of a position, there are quite a number of things that go with it, particularly employment. I would be asked, I'm told you are given some 20, 30 police uh, recruits position a year. Of course, which is not true, not true at all. If I get like other members of parliament, I would probably get one at most, and I don't remember when I last got to. But you see, uh, even my own constituents would not understand, you are now a bigger person. You are now the fourth in command, and I don't think I helped them much, because I also pretended really to be the fourth in command in terms of the country. But if you look at the general outlook of a country, a deputy speaker is obviously not the fourth in command. It's obvious, absolutely not. Maybe for us, the lawyers, we can, um, you know, uh, we can treat it as if that is so, because if the speaker is, uh, is a third in command, it is assumed the next in command would be his deputy. That's not true. Uh, but of course, uh, we have some position of privilege. You are in a position where you can be able to talk to one officer or the other. And I was able to push a few things uh, using that position. But I can tell you, uh, it has made it a bit more difficult for me, because people expect that I should have done much more and probably I did. All rulings, all rulings that are done in the National Assembly, and I'm very careful because, uh, you know, I notice 
and I know for sure that I have got uh, an extremely competent boss in the Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Justin Mutul, whom we have worked for a very long time. Between 2002 and 2007, he was a minority whip. I was the minority deputy whip, even if it was for a short time. And we've worked with him. I worked with him again in CMD when we were out together. There's one time we both lost elections. So we went and joined the Centre for Multiparty Democracy where he was the chairperson. I was one of the secretaries. So we still worked with him in the year, I mean, since 2013 all the way to now. I've been in the speaker's panel, either as the first chair or now as the deputy speaker, we've worked with him. I don't want to tell you that I have any ruling that is uh, something that I can be very proud of because all the rulings in the National Assembly are reserved for the speaker himself. And he has made extremely good rulings, extremely good rulings. But the only thing that I can say I'm very proud of, actually two things. One is I activated the liaison committee. To, we, we did more than 80 meetings. I was checking in my records yesterday. More than 80 meetings. But the epitome of, of it is having, uh, introducing for the first time forum for committees. Despite the, um, despite the problems that we had with, uh, with, with COVID, we managed to do the first one and it was very successful. Uh, our chief guest was the, uh, the former speaker of Tanzanian uh, parliament. We did another one uh, recently, uh, also officiated by the Speaker of um, IALA, East Africa Legislative Assembly. This is actually a question of where um, the committees showcase what they do on a day-to-day basis, so that we can demystify Parliament and show our citizens that it is not about sitting in the House and contributing in the Assembly here. There are also other works that are done outside uh, the, the assembly, that is uh, the committees especially. Some members are extremely uh, critical uh, and they do quite a lot of work in the committees and don't do much work in the limelight here. Others do a lot of work at home. I mean, when they are in funerals, when they are in harambes, those kind of things. So that we have done, it was done for the first time. And during that, we launched a Kiswahili version of our standing orders. We were able to open our committees uh, for you know life coverage it has been having challenges here and there uh, there are quite a number of things therefore that we achieved using that uh, that uh, forum for part uh, for committees it is something that i'm very proud of another thing lastly which, which i can say which came up as a result of the circumstances of our term which is the covid uh, issue we managed to you know uh, take parliament from being uh, you know a mechanical parliament where you just have to come here we started doing electronic, uh, you know, and we were able to succeed quite a, a, a good, uh, to a good extent. Of course, that we would thank uh, the Speaker and the Parliamentary Service Commission, but it was also managed by the, the liaison committee. First of all, I think that is easy for me, very easy, because, uh, you know, I've served in all sides of the House. Between 2002 and 2007, I was in high opposition, complete opposition, nothing to do with government. When I came back in 2013, uh, I came back using a small party, Kanu, when you know it was URP and TNA, which was the main party. But I ended up getting into, we got into some coalition of some sort. So I became a member of government by coalition. Now, I have served as a, an opposition person, served as a coalition beneficiary, and then recently I came to government, high and dry, you know, I, am, I came through Jubilee, so it was, you know, real government. Over time and out of maturity, you come to realize that members of parliament use uh, parties to find their way to parliament. But basically they are the same human beings. Parties might have positions, your own constituency might have positions. But uh, you realize that, uh, you know, over and above everything, we have everything else, we are all legislators representing interest. When you see a person on the other side of uh, parliament, I mean, either the minority or majority, and he's very passionate about something, you realize that probably he's speaking to his local constituency. And you have to understand the situation. Sometimes you would even find members of parliament here who are very vigorous about something. So I'll give you a good example of a friend of mine who was my schoolmate in the, the university, the Honorable TJ Kajuan, very good fellow and a very good friend of mine. But at one point when we were serving in the speaker's panel, he came to parliament here with the whistles. 
He ended up even losing his position as one of the chairs of committees. But when I looked at him and uh, from my own thinking, I knew he was also speaking to his constituents. The constituents were very unhappy about something. So as long as your constituents are happy about something, you also must be as unhappy as them. And you must be able to display it in that manner. So uh, how I have been able to manage is because one, I think I have, I have absolutely huge number of friends in the assembly, whatever party they come with. So over and above everything else, we are friends. So I have never had a problem with uh, making one decision, a decision one way or the other. Of course, once in a while you would hear somebody saying you are biased. But they don't even mean it themselves, I'm sure. When you look at their eye, you know they are actually speaking to someone else. So I think uh, in my term, both as a, a panel member and now as a deputy speaker, uh, there is no time. In fact, sometimes I'm even accused by my own party, thinking that probably I am uh, too much on the other side. But that's also not true. It's not true. I was basically do, I basically do my work. When I go to that seat, I forget everything else. I basically do my work according to the standing orders. If you are wrong, you are wrong, even if you are my own cousin in the house. That's actually true. That's, that's extremely true. This uh, position of the Deputy Speaker has put me into a lot of issues in terms of finding very little time for almost everything else. Uh, for my family, I think I'm lucky because I am not very nocturnal, so I'm able to find my, soil, uh, my way to, the, to my home early enough. And it's nothing to do with any responsibilities, but it is just the way I am wired. I'm not nocturnal, I've said. So uh, that is not a big issue. The issue of family, I give them their time. Uh, well, I know the, the greatest problem is the te the, my phone. Uh, many times I go days on end without talking anybody from my family easily because, look, you arrive home, you are still on phone. Yes, you are physically there, but you are on phone. So it's as good as you are not around. That is my greatest problem. But in terms of my constituency, I'm a deputy speaker, you know, in the course of the week. Over the weekends, I find my, my, my way home. I've never had an issue with that but of course it is the only issues is sometimes we get into some trips out of the country even uh, therefore missing some of the weekends which i used to do my home uh, my constituency uh, religiously every saturday and uh, sunday i was in the constituency but when i became the, the, the deputy speaker sometimes i'm out of the country particularly dealing with matters of acp eu which which i'm the leader of delegation of both the national assembly and the senate so that, that, that's the small issue. But basically, we are trying to manage. Politics generally takes a lot of your time. But you balance it if you can. Sometimes you are not able to. Well, uh, let me say this. Uh, I know the, I mean, coming to Parliament has become a prime thing now. Uh, everybody would want to be here. And it makes sense. I mean, why would, why would you not be a member of Parliament? The only thing I would advise uh, the young politicians is that um, Make sure as you go around. First of all, don't be too sure when you are running for a position that you will win. But always make sure as you do it, you do it even if you are not successful at the first instance. There are always possibilities in future. Be very peaceful about your campaign. Be center your campaign on issues. Don't personalize it. Don't put insults. Reduce violence because there is a lot of violence. <coughs> there is a lot of violence in, um, in, in politics and uh, insults and vulgar language. Avoid those. They, they will not help you. Anybody who has been um, into vulgar way of trying to get to politics, they never succeed. Anybody who was diplomatic, even if they lose the first time, they will be fine. They will make it eventually. I think we have done well. We have the parliamentary week. We now have the forum for committees. Uh, Basically, the National Assembly is open. You can, you can come in if you are dressed well and you, have, uh, you can be cleared, you can go to the gallery, you can follow proceedings. We are live on TV. That's very critical. If you are live on TV, even those people who don't come to the National Assembly will follow you from their own bed, bedrooms and sitting rooms. So we are basically open. We have demystified quite a number of things about the Assembly over a long period of time. And uh, since there are too many of us now, unlike before, uh, citizenry are basically able to interact with members of parliament in various forums. So I think in that we have probably been able to do well. 
I wouldn't say there is anything much more we need we can do because the only thing we can do now is to enhance. Even when we decided to have the Kiswahili version of uh, the standing orders, the basic issue was that, uh, you know, there are quite a number of Kenyans who are only conversant with Kiswahili, not, uh, not English. So basically that was also a situation of opening up. We do some small other things, uh, PR things. Look at, for example, sports. Uh, the Bunge sports team, for example, sometimes competes with some, you know, uh, small teams from constituencies. That is opening up for people to see that, uh, you know, uh, so-and-so can, you know, also kick a football like, like the common man in the village. So that uh, member of parliament is not seen now in, as that very distant big man. The big man sy syndrome is we are, what we are trying to remove. But I think generally we have done well in that bit. Uh, <laughs> I am still, uh, I still feel I should serve uh, one more time uh, for the Soy North constituency. I am putting my best foot uh, forward to make sure that I, I am re-elected. Uh, that is my plan for the next five years. So that's some of the things that I was not able to, and many people would ask you, you have been there for 10 years, you have been there for 15 years. There is nothing that you can finish in terms of, even when you elect another member, they will still have something to do, some role to proceed with. So even a person who's been elected many, many, many times, they still have something that they can do. There is always value, and I can say this without fear of contradiction, there is value in uh, having continuity. There is always value. And I will say also that there is value sometimes in bringing a new person, because you will be bringing new ideas. But the value of uh, continuity is look, for example, if you are managing some uh, CDF projects, when a new person comes, they want to start their own line of things because they also need to create a legacy from the, for themselves. So sometimes the others are left uh, unattended. So, you know, and again, I remember in my first time, I employed one person, only one person, for my five years. Come 2013, 2017, I did quite well. I will not tell you the numbers, but there were quite a number of people. I could, because at that point, I was even confident. I could walk to an office, uh, you know, and uh, discuss something with somebody there, try and see how we can be able to get some opportunities for constituents. In my, set, uh, in my, in my position now, I was able also to put some networks, both within and outside. Uh, I can tell you I have sent uh, four or five, actually five actually, five uh, constituents out of the country. One has gone to Italy, another one Germany, another one Australia, another one uh, on full scholarship to China. You know, because of the connections uh, that I created out of here. Others have basically helped. The other day we were able to help somebody to go to Qatar. A first time, and I'm not having a problem with them, would find it difficult because first he will come to create that network he will have also to establish himself. Over a long period of time, I've established myself one way or another, but now I think I'm in that position where I can be able to dedicate even more time to the constituency. So there is value in both. And I consider, if you asked me, those constituents who have been lucky are the ones who, re, you know, recreated their own leaders, propelled them to huge offices. I'm sure there is no first time I could be a deputy speaker easily, even if they have the most. Look, we are having 70% of first-timers uh, every time. But I can assure you, I have not seen a deputy speaker coming from uh, the new members. They would want to have value from somebody who's had some experience. So even if you want to get even other positions here, it's always critical. You propel your own to higher levels. Look at anybody who has become a president out of rising through parliament. They, you know, they are created over a long period of time look at uh, the ones in the opposition or the ones in, in the ruling, they have come through the system. Yeah. Uh, well, my new passion, of course, is golf. Mm -hmm. And I, I do it very passionately. Somebody tells me I'm addicted. I don't mind it if I was because I think I'm addicted to the right thing. I could do my practice. It settles your mind. Uh, many other things. Many other things. I, I enjoy uh, workouts generally. I would have been a good athlete if I had that capacity. And I've run for Bunge, by the way. I've represented this assembly five times in uh, marathons between 2002, in my younger days. 
between 2002, put it 2003 and 2007, I used to represent Parliament together with the Honorable Kaiseri, Honorable Mungatana, Honorable Munya, Honorable Keter. We went to Poland uh, Parliamentary Marathon five years in a row. I like athletics and I like traveling, both within uh, uh, and without, uh, but mostly within. So I, I enjoy traveling. I, I think I'm impatient. I don't like staying in one place for too long. In fact, now I'm already feeling the, the heat of this interview because I've been here for too long. And, 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 th and that is me. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add? Or your short? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, my parting shot, uh, if, 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 if I may. Uh, I've been a deputy speaker for the last five years. I am uh, a lucky one to have been elected and opposed uh, during my time. That is confidence, a lot of confidence from, from my colleagues. We've worked with them and uh, I believe I've done my best in this position. Uh, in the same vein, I want to wish them very well. They have been very good members. I know those people out of the assembly really want to come here, may, many of them, including in my own constituency. But let me honestly wish uh, those members who are here the best. Uh, I pray for them that as much as possible they can be able to make it back because this is one uh, of the positions that is highly misunderstood, being a member of parliament. People, they elect you today and after two days they begin to regret and they begin, uh, you know, criticizing you. I know the difficulties they go through. I wish them all the best and I thank them for having given me the opportunity to serve them. As I've said, I think I did my best. Of course, a few flaws here and there, I'm sure, because we are human beings. They are also human beings. I keep telling my constituents that when you elect uh, a human being, you expect them to have uh, flaws here and there, because they are human beings. If you really want the perfect ones, if we could have the angels, we'd be lucky. But unfortunately, they will not be here for us. So I wish them well. I thank them. And most importantly, I thank my boss. I have served under the Speaker Muturi for the last five years. Put it ten years, actually nine years, because the other one was shorter. I'm very proud of him. He is one of those bosses that you would never feel um, intimidated. He is one of those people who would give you an opportunity to grow. I'll give you a good example, and I'm not going to mention any house. In some houses or some parliaments out of um, the Republic, uh, some speakers have removed their own deputies as chairs of liaison and they took it over themselves. Now, when you have a boss like the Honorable Muturi, he would want to give you even more work. I can tell you he's the chair of the Procedure and House Rules Committee. But for the last five years, he has made me chair that committee faithfully and religiously. If it was another boss, he would give me no opportunity. And I think also on my part, I've been very respectful. I've really worked under him, knowing very well that he is my boss, and we've served extremely well. I'm very grateful to him and to the rest of uh, the parliamentary fraternity. The clerks department and the, the employees here are very good people, very competent people. I thank uh, all of them and I pray for them that they should find success in everything else that they do.